the recording. All right. Uh, on the motion, this house will implement fairness doctrines on broadcast news media with significant audience reach. I would like to welcome the first speaker of the proposition. Here, here. Am I audible? Uh, yeah, yes, you are. Okay, I'll take my peer eyes verbally. Yes, I'm so audible. Yes, I'm so audible. I'm going to start my speech in three, two, one. Panel, they determine, select, shape, control, and restrict content in order to serve interests of dominant elites. We affirm this motion. What is the fairness doctrine, right? Three cases under this yes. One, the doctrine requires broadcasters to devote time to discussing controversial issues of public importance, i.e. the Federal Communications Commission in America requiring all broadcast media to provide coverage for all candidates equally. Secondly, when an individual or a person is opposed on media, the station is required to air this person or a representative for this person to come and speak up for this person and present their views. Thirdly, where does this debate actually take place? This debate takes place in a liberal democracy, that is to say U.S. Japan and France, right? Why is this particularly true? A, these are the countries that actually have the big broadcast media in this debate today. Secondly, media companies are more free to express their views due to the idea of liberalism and freedom of speech that these countries are actually built upon that. But even if that wasn't the case, it only happens here because A, government psychotocracies do not allow media houses with alternative views to actually thrive because they oppose them. Secondly, they do not actually have big media stations in these instances. And thirdly, majority of the assets are all owned by the state in like these countries, i.e. China, who manipulate news in their favor and do not have like private ownership of these kinds of companies, right? Now, what is the fairness doctrine not, right? A, fairness doctrine does not apply to giving space to autocracy or terrorists which actually promote harmful views, which are like the liberal democracies already refuse in their agenda, but alternative views that do not lead to like the harm of people, i.e. military expenditure and policy making. B, it is not about policing hate speech and defamation because their laws already refuse those and actually consent right now what is broadcast media in this debate today a news media are elements of mass media that focus on delivering news to the general public right in this particular debate we focus on broadcasters news through television radio or any live podcast but not twitter facebook or newspapers because they are non-broadcast media but secondly broadcast media has presence on these different non-broadcast media right now basically broadcast media with significant outreach in this debate today is going to be referred to as big media now what do you mean by significant outreach right a many people actually yeah. watch it. I, the cnn with over 87 houses 87 houses in the United States. I'll take you later. Secondly, crosses many boundaries from one country to another, i.e. Al Jazeera, which has over 270 million views in 140 countries, right? Why are we applying the fairness doctrine to this media? Five issues. A, due to the high viewers, it actually has the power to create narratives that influence personal decisions. B, the greater places in the system, which gives them the power to suppress other smaller companies or other smaller media houses. Thirdly, the power to influence public opinion and how we actually perceive other groups in our societies. Fourthly, the ability to suppress alternative voices when they actually come to speak. And finally, as a fifth arm of the government, it is failing to hold the government accountable on what they actually do and it prevents bad news to like the different people, right? Now, how will our model actually work? to work in three major ways, four major ways, right? A, each issue must be given equal airing time to another controversial issue. I, Biden wants to invent Taiwan, right? We'll give alternative views or different views that actually meet get this one. Secondly, issues where certain individuals have actually been accused and we will require them to actually call this person or like get a representative for this person to actually come and express the person's views. Thirdly, media houses should have different people of different ideologies to come and sit down and express their views. And finally, they'll be held accountable by the state agency of communication, i.e. by taking away their license, right? Now, POI taken. A third of France are vaccine skeptics with reasons ranging from not believing in the science to thinking it will change their DNA. Could you clarify for us how you want that perspective given airtime with this doctrine? 
panel, in this debate today, we look out for giving good information to everyone, right? We will encourage you to come and express your views as you are, right? We want you to come and express your views, all of you, and the individual comes and decide what best suits them because we believe individuals are better at actually discussing what actually better maximizes their happiness and like their better well-being, right? Now, moving on to the case with A, why governments need to actually intervene in media induced social polarization. Secondly, the effect of capitalism on big media. Thirdly, what trade-offs are we willing to make? And fourthly, why are media houses, governments, and societies engaged actually or incentivized actually do so? Our second speaker is going to handle how our, our world our world would actually look like with an implemented Paris doctrine. And secondly, how our model is actually more effective in dealing with that issue, right? Now, panel, why governments actually need to in, intervene in media and just social polarization, right? Social polarization is when people leave the middle ground and are pushed further into like their beliefs, right? Now, the extreme, i.e., like the extreme side of their positions like the liberalist right becoming like radicalist right but now how does this come about this is basically because continuously feeding people of the same information about the same topic with the same narrative right now these people are being told the same thing at the same time every single time now you tell them how abortion is bad over and over again. So it makes some things in their heads and makes them like believe how it is bad. Now, how is this particularly harmful? Because it leads to extremist actions on people with views that actually oppose those views. I.e., since 1977, there have been 42 bombings on abortion clinics. And on June 7th, recently, anti-abortion extremists burned down the Planned Parenthood clinic in Tennessee, right? This particularly harms people. But secondly, people lose trust in media. Like when you present one side of the story, it implies that you're influenced by others because we as a public expect other sides of stories right i.e like you you now start to start now start having narratives in our heads that you do not try to actually give us a good information right now this pushes us actually lose trust in you i.e in the u.s 30 percent of the conservatives and more than 45 percent of people actually do not trust their media right now what does this actually lead to right this is harmful because people look for alternative sources of ink of like information like social media which cannot actually be regulated by the government and most of these actually media sources actually have fake news conspiracy theories and hate speech which actually leads to people actually hating each other and like killing each other like people turn into extremist views like the capitalist capitol hill actually revolt recently right now panel secondly the effect of capitalism on big media right panel two things under this media ownership we have to understand the majority of media is actually owned by like big companies and like these big companies are like capitalistic in nature which want to actually maximize their benefits and like forward their views right they will actually influence these different media companies to put their the views of capitalism is good than actually giving a media balance now we need something to actually hold these companies into like check and like make them whatever right we have examples of Viacom owning like Paramount, Comedy Central, and MTV Bet, all those actually owned by these companies. But secondly, how does media actually get funds, this big media, right? It gets funds from like donations, right? Because we only give them only 20% like as a viewer. So they'll get funds from like donations and advertisements. And basically when they get these funds from like these big organizations, they'll be incentivized to like do what these organizations right, actually want to do, like their views, which is actually very harmful, right? Now, panel, our trade-offs are A, donations or incomes from charities that were sponsoring specific projects because we have have a role as governments and media to take effective balance of information to people. Secondly, chilling free, free speech, right? People who want to only express their views like on standards where they aren't opposed, right? These people will actually run up. But we believe that it is justified because as the media and the governments, we have a role to give these people information that is both sides, right? To enable them to actually make good decisions for themselves. Thirdly, risk of politicians abusing power. It doesn't happen because governments have checks and balances, right? Due to like the social contracts and like they want to be voted back into power. So they are pushed, right? To actually work for the people and give them like this good information other than a side where we only have media right media has no checks and balances because it has nothing holding it accountable it has no citizens right so panel we affirm this motion given the fact that we want to give people both sides of the story to maximize their choices i rest my case <laughs> All right, thank the speaker for that speech. Um, so I just also just making a note that WSCC rules technically require that um the cameras of the speakers be switched on at all times, not just when the speaker is speaking. Uh, so if Team Uganda could switch on the cameras, that would be great. Um, just making a note that that's what the rules say. Unless you know, have internet difficulties, then we'll make adjustments. All right, uh, checking my panel is ready. Just give a thumbs up when you are. 
All right, uh, to open this debate for the opposition, can we have the first speaker of the opposition? Here, here. Uh, checking that I'm audible. Yep, yes, you are. Perfect. So you want to, we're just turning the fan off because our papers are going all over the place. Yeah, amazing. Speaker, in the name of balance, we are extremely worried that what you do is reduce the diversity of news. That marginalized groups are the first thing that is cut from broadcast media. That the effect of this policy entrenches existing power structures and creates a chilling effect on what news is considered of national importance and gets airtime in the first place. Panel, our contention is not that the news media right now is perfect. Our contention is merely that their policy exacerbates the problem and creates new ones. You can't have a fair media without a free media. What's our stance in this debate? We support the status quo where regulations on broadcast news media are centered around regulations that uphold existing laws, such as on defamation, which can result in the issuing of corrections, preventing anti-competitive practices or illegal methods of information gathering. In short, those which are required to prevent overreach, but keeping in mind the need to guarantee the independence of media. Few arguments at LO. First, this doctrine violates the right to the freedom of press, Second, this reduces the quality, depth, and variety of content people receive. Lastly, that this doctrine increases the likelihood of dangerous content being given additional airtime. Before that, let's engage with our case. Firstly, on their stance. Speaker, this debate isn't just about WLDs, there's nonsense framing. India, Rwanda, Mexico, all still have the private ownership of media. They're not complete autocracies as they characterize. Rather, they still have existing freedom of press. Sure, it's not perfect, but it still exists, and this debate is still about them. The reason Team Uganda does this framing in this debate is to run away from the round, because they are scared. They're scared of how Victor Orban, Narendra Modi, and AMLO misuse this to increase their clutches over the media. From Prime Minister's speech itself, they're already losing out on 80% of the world. We think that that already puts us over them. Let's then engage with our case. First, they argue social polarization happens because of echo chambers. Like, sure, but you're already telling conservative people conservative news. But that means the trust still exists on our side of the house because the most extreme rednecks go to the most extreme platforms, whereas a lot of moderates are still existing with the platforms that we want to engage with. That means trust is preserved. But also, you have incentives to platform moderates because you want to expand and boost legitimacy. But here's the very important flip. They show conservatives, Bernie Sanders, and AOC on their side of the house. That's when these people think liberals are taking over your safe space. That's when you think this is an overreach on the regulation of the media. That's when they move to egregious alternatives. That's when they move to Alex Jones, who denies the Sandy Hook school shootings. This was the problem the prime minister sets up. They create that problem. They exacerbate it. But second, on lobbying by private actors, look. This exists on either side of the house. No side will perfectly regulate it away. But the important thing to note is that it will continue to exist on their side of the house. And what that means is sure, in name you are fair, but you end up with what Fox does right now, where you bring in people from the other side who you can straw man, who are incompetent at doing things like pushing their point forward, and therefore you can easily delegitimize and shut down. That is appalling. On the first argument. The institution of this doctrine erodes press freedoms. Free press is critical to democratic functioning because they are the primary check and balance on state power. God themselves agreed to this. Then, we believe that sh states should have as little control over it as necessary for broadcast news media to operate. This newly expanded role of a state body will make two important determinations for broadcast news according to PROP themselves. First, was the news item of public importance importance and therefore should we expect to see coverage? Second, was the coverage sufficiently balanced through methods such as equal airtime being given to opposing viewpoints? This interferes with the independence of broadcast media necessary for the functioning of a good democracy. Because rather than a multiplicity of stations making determinations on what is in the public interest of that journalism, polling, being on the ground, 
It shifts the Sith overlord power to determine that news agencies should be covering certain issues. These are literal editorial content decisions, something that we go out of our way to keep away from state bodies. Further, once news is covered, the state and its representatives can insist that there isn't enough airtime being given to their point of view. This increases political interference and particularly favors incumbent governments. Between the 40s and 80s in the US when the Fairness Doctrine existed, Nixon held up the Washington Post for publishing about Watergate. Yes. Watergate by arguing that other issues were of greater public interest. JFK literally used it to demand airtime to counter criticism on the Bay of Pigs. Roosevelt used it to shut down conservative critique of the New Deal. And can you imagine if it still existed under the Trump era? His administration demanding a right of response to every single negative news story. This only worsens in weak democratic states that this round is also about, as I've proven, where states can use challenges around airtime to shut down critiques of the government. That is something we were never willing to stand for. On the second argument, this doctrine reduces the quality, depth, and variety of content people receive. Some news organizations, sure, already put out diverse viewpoints and controversial issues because it increases viewership or because it makes their content more engaging. This is in direct contrast to what First Prop tells you about echo chambers. To be clear, we're not against broadcast media making these editorial decisions. What Team India opposed is states forcing news organizations to apply this doctrine that creates unintentional consequences which erode the quality of news. There are three ways the erosion of editorial freedom reduces the depth and variety of content people receive. First, news organizations are compelled to reduce the complexity of the stories they present. With only half the time to explore a piece on, say, vaccine effectiveness, you also now need to give our time to vaccine skepticism. Second, it forces stations to deprioritize types of minority content because you have to trade off the equal airtime somewhere. Equal airtime given to issues of national interest and you have to cut them down elsewhere. Third, investigative journalistic pieces become even more rare. In the current climate, these pieces face intense barriers. Now, with the added burden of equal airtime to opposing yeah, viewpoints, I Say, in investigating the child abuse of the Catholic Church, this is likely to reduce the number of editors willing to invest in long-form investigative journalism. For the average viewer, this means more superficial <coughs> content. And you're less likely to see local, regional, or minority content, as this is the news that gets cut first. Increased established voices being heard instead of new ones. This, in turn, reduces political choice and agency. Before I move on to the next argument, yeah. Seeing the POI on the second argument, this doctrine increases the likelihood of dangerous content being given additional airtime. First, the use of the fairness doctrine to demand a right of response is going to produce a series of challenges, is going to produce a series of challenges that their voice needs to be heard. This elevates previously fringe to mainstream where toxic racism and sexism begin to be perceived as equally legitimate, increasing their reach and popularity. Second, or if you don't platform, but you face the continuous threat of legal challenge from litigious, well-funded fringe groups and entrenched dominant... Yeah, I'm going to interest... cut you off here. I think Tim Uganda just dropped off the call. Um, so I've started the time at 7 minutes 26. My suspicion is that they may have been frozen from when uh, you say okay to the POI which is like slightly before seven. So I think we'll wait for them to come back first uh, and then we'll see what happens from there. Yeah. I'm going to start the timer in the meantime and let the uh, outcom know that uh, they dropped from the call. Yep. Wait, don't, don't. Yeah. All right, I think we're going to, can I, can I confirm that you're back on the call? Yeah, uh, can I check? Uh, what was the last okay. thing that you heard? Like, so yeah. we had a problem with network. So we didn't hear the last speech. Uh, sorry, can I ask you to repeat that a bit? Uh, the last part got cut off. I stopped at 6.20 minutes. That's where we were cut off. When mm. you were still speaking about diversity. Mm. Okay, got, got it. So you got cut off at around 6 minutes, 20 seconds. Um, So based on my tracking, that seems to be somewhere in the middle of the second argument um, that was given by LO. Um, so um, yes. we only got you like off the call prop like like completely off the call at 726. So there is a bit of a one minute difference. Uh I'm not particularly sure on what the rule says on this. So I'm going to ask a member of the cap to come in to clarify the rules. Uh because 
what we traditionally do is that we follow what the judges say, but in this case, I don't think it's completely fair because we did get an extra minute that you guys didn't. So I'm going to ask the cap to come in and hopefully we can clarify like what the procedure is going forward. Would that be all right? Okay, give me one second. In the meantime, I am going to pause the recording. Um, this forces patients. Second, we believe that this forces patients to deprioritize the types of minority content because you have to trade off the equal airtime given to issues of national interest and just cut down elsewhere. But third, investigative journalistic pieces become even more rare because in the current climate, these pieces face intense barriers. Now, with the added burden of equal airtime to opposing viewpoints, say in investigating child abuse within the Catholic Church, this is likely to reduce the number of editors willing to invest in long-form investigative journalism pieces. Here's what this means. For the average viewer, this means more superficial content. You are less likely to see local, regional, or minority content as this is the news that gets cut first, increasing established voices being heard instead of new ones and reducing political choice and agency. Before I move on to my next argument, POI, Perfect. Seeing no engagement from them on the third argument. We think that this doctrine increases the like. Okay. So it's basically, how do you actually have the diversity on your side of the house when actually one type of news is being preached over and over again because that's the dominant group? Yeah. Speaker, we already explained this at the start of the first argument with nuanced incentive analysis. That is to say you want to appear legitimate, you want to expand your audience, therefore you are more likely to be diverse in your representation. On the third argument, this doctrine increases the likelihood of dangerous content being given additional airtime. Why? First, the use of the fairness doctrine to demand a right of response is going to produce a series of challenges that their voice needs to be heard. This elevates previously fringe ideas to the mainstream, where toxic racism and sexism begin to be perceived as equally legitimate, increasing their reach and popularity. Or you don't platform them, but you face the continuous threat of legal challenge from litigious, well-funded fringe groups and entrenched dominant interests. Note, it is not marginalized women from Muslim communities in India challenging Hindu majoritarian news channels. Rather, it is US mega churches suing CNN when they feel criticized or their power is threatened. This solidifies their standing, amplifies the loudest, and creates a chilling effect on these stations in the future. This policy at its worst empowers the privilege to spread information. You can't have a fair media without a free media oppose. All right, I thank the speaker for that speech. Before we begin, I noticed that there's an individual called uh, counsel uh, in the call. Could I ask you to please rename yourself so that we know uh, which nation you're affiliated with and in what position uh, you are coming to this uh, tournament from? Uh, can I check that my judges are ready? All right, uh, to continue this debate for the, for the proposition, can we have the second speaker of the proposition? Here, here. Okay, uh, my name is Anna Barak, and I'm going to start my speech in three, two, okay, okay, yeah. Okay, I'm going to start my speech in three, two, one. And uh, creating a world where people hate antagonists, right? From a world, from the famous words of Karl Popper, we, he states that you may be right, I may be wrong, but when we come together, we may come closer to the truth, right? You don't really understand an antagonist until you understand why he's a protagonist in his own world. But no, what you get from self proposition is the basic ideology that, you know, are allowing equal views from popular 
from uh, from popular news media sites is going to promote a kind of justice racism from the opposition. But no, as my first bit at 10, she talked about how we framed that in first bit about liberal democracy laws, right? Things like hate speech, secondly, things like like hate speech, defamation or racist toxins cannot be allowed by government, right? In liberal democracies. And there are mechanisms existing in society that stop these kinds of ideas. What we are promoting are alternative views, things like uh, economic policies, political ideas, military expenditure, things like that, that allow people to engage in matters, you know, controversial issues that allow business to have an informed decision. Finally, what do we get from side position, right? Their second argument, right, was framed around forcing states, right, um, forcing states to depopulate minorities, not okay. Forcing states to depopulate, to prioritize, right, minorities. But Panda, why do you find this more on their side of the case, right? First of all, you have when you when you deny people to have a kind of a fairness document, right, in other words, a bar of a opinion for, for a news media outlet, you find that there's only going to be one narrative promoted, right? For example, if I'm going to promote a kind of idea that Africans are poor, then there is no, it's it's going to create a kind of stereotype in the case, which harms the narrative. But no, listen, that what in, in the event, right, minorities, yes, are going to be suppressed. But let's understand that problem, the problem may not, okay, like, the problem is that is not that they are aren't true, but they are all incomplete, being that they are also Africans who are rich, which makes the story incomplete, right? Which, which, which is why we need to have all the alternative or a particular idea to allow people to make a decision, right? We are looking out for the for, for individuals, right? For the audience, right? And I know they come and talk about how uh you can you can have a, a fair right? Fair media without, you know, a fairness doctrine. But Panda, let's understand how this news media works, right? So when you have a news media that actually uh uh, uh sixty nine percent of income, not okay, sixty nine percent of its income comes from advertisement, right? You find that they are going to, and twenty percent comes from the audience. You find that. News media are going to look for the, the best interest for themselves, right? And that is looking for you know, the advertisers, right? So in other words, people are going to look towards profit maximization, which then promotes the narratives of advertisers, not the people and not of the best interest of the state. You find that people are actually going to be harmed here because as we analyze here, we find that if, if individuals are promote are, are promote only one kind of narrative, it's going to lead to polarization, right? This is the consumption of only one kind of similar content. And that's how does this look like? This looks like, uh, uh, this looks like, uh, this looks like, uh, uh, like, okay, this looks like kind of media, right? Uh, uh, like individuals sorry, becoming extremists because they believe that their ideas are being suppressed, right? But no, as we analyze the kind of trust that people have in, in media, right? We find that 73% are Democrats, right? Liberals, they trust the media, but 10% are the conservatives and they are, uh, are conservatives and they don't really trust the media because of the ideologies that have been promoted in liberal democracies, right? And so you find that people's, uh, uh, people's in, like, ideas are being suppressed because of wanting to promote one kind of narrative. So what does this lead to? It's going to lead to a kind of backlash, right? That affects people, right? Because because hey, individuals, okay, like as you have the same thing for a long time, it becomes kind of right, right? When you're influenced, when you are exposed to only one particular idea for a long period of time, you start to believe that it's a right. So individuals who feel like a, a difference, this kind of narrative, are going to be suppressed. But Pano, let's also analyze their third point, right? They talk about they talk about politicians using it to push particular narrative. But Pano, why do we see this actually harmful? On the other side of the case, where uh, companies actually lobby these media companies, you find that in our side of the case, we give you a uh, government, right? Governments who have a, an we obligation to their citizens, right, to to ensure that the media promoted in this is actually, you know, balanced because it promotes a kind of uh, uh, it, it promotes a kind of. Uh, <coughs> more like views that enables people to, uh, to uh, make informed decisions, right? So what happens when you only have one particular narrative? You are indirectly persuaded towards that idea, right? That is what it looks like. So what, in have a kind of informed decision, it lets people to make decisions that are in their best interest. This looks like a uh, uh, voting, you know, the democracies, right? People making decisions, voting for the right people, basing on all the various information that they've received from people. But if someone comes and promotes only one kind of narrative, you're going to find 
a lot of people, right, are going to are going to actually need to Point. make you know, very negative decisions. And by the way, in our similar case, we analyze the chapter of this debate. They come and talk so deeply about free speech. And as much as we accept free speech, we are chill, we are willing to chill it, like promote a. a are uh, as uh, accepted, right? That some in some point in time that fairness doctrines choose free speech. But Pano, it is not an absolute right to have speech uh, to have free speech in our country, right? There are limitations to free speech. This is, looks like when it comes, you know, public morality, right? Public order, where people are being are being influenced to a decision. Now, but you cannot talk about individuals. Uh, burning down Planned Parenthood clinics in Tennessee. You find that individuals cannot. That actually leads to people who don't believe that you know, certain things are uh, should be changed, right? So they act out of aggressiveness because you know their ideas are being changed. So next of all, so you find that you know uh, if, if if this thing affects you know uh, groups of people, you find that people need to change the way. Uh, you find that it is it is an obligation of the government in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in a social contract theory to protect these individuals, right? So, free speech in outside of the case looks like individuals not wanting to share a certain individuals who discuss alternatives. But Panda, we say that this is a necessary trade-off in order to promote all alternatives to be provided, so that it can reduce on the stereotype and it can also reduce on the on the on the on the on the line of knowledge basically of individuals awesome. and that's the kind of that could be politicians so we find that on the other side of the case that people actually like like people have a kind of checks and balances when it comes to uh these democratic countries right sorry these are governments right whereby individuals are, are held accountable right which you don't find in private sectors so you find that it, 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 uh, it, there's a need for balance of opinions which by even in the event that these individuals are, are are being are you promoting a kind of narrative it does not stop opposition of those politicians to actually spread their own ideas so that they can enable individuals to make some kind of informed decision so what i, I can my debate, I would like to uh, analyze a few things, right? One, we come and show you the importance of balance of, 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 of views, right? For media, because of the kind of influence they have outwardly, which then, it, 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 which may shows the kind of influence. We show you how promoting one kind of narrative leads to polarization, right? People are driven towards extreme ideas because they feel oppressed. And then thirdly, we show you that in the, in the event that Okay, we show you that the importance of like that these media houses are also being held accountable for what you know they are. All right, I tend to speak for that speech. Um, so I think at various points in that speech early, I think there was a bit of like lag here and there. So I think uh can I just confirm to you, Ugala, do you ever get a like internet connection is unstable message from Zoom earlier? Uh do you see a message like that? from in Team Uganda. All right, so I'm, I'm going to suggest in that case, maybe it might be helpful for Team Uganda to switch off the camera uh, because I think that the video bandwidth may be picking up a bit more uh, bandwidth than necessary. Uh, it is a, this is something that the rules do allow me to do as chair if I access that the internet connectivity may become a problem for the debate. So I think in that case, in Team Uganda, I would say that just switch on your camera during the speech and then uh, without, outside of the debate, feel free to keep the cameras off um, just so that we don't have any dropouts thereafter. All right, checking if my panel is ready. All right, uh, I'd like to welcome the second speaker of the opposition to continue this debate. Here, here. Um, hi, we have a, an inquiry. Yes, go for Is it. Yes. You gonna, um, did you hear our second speaker speak because of that problem? Oh, like, no, no. Was there any? Oh, no. So we heard the you second speaker. Oh, sorry. Uh, we, we did hear the second prop speech. Uh, I think there was just like one or two moments when there was a bit of a gap. And then after that, um, the speech came back. And then it came back a little bit faster than the speaker was actually speaking, which normally means that uh, the internet connectivity dropped for a little bit, but didn't drop too much to the point that you were kicked off the call. And thus, you were, it was able to pick up um, quick, quickly enough after that. So I think that uh, is the reason why I'm suggesting maybe we can switch off the cameras. Um, we can maybe 
observe and see how whether this is better this time around. And then if it seems like it's not improving much, then I may uh, request that maybe the third proposition gives a speech without the camera on. But we'll do with that when we get there. Yeah. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Yeah, I'll opt to whenever you're ready. Hi, can you hear me? <laughs> yep, loud and clear. Team Uganda says that the reason the political system is harmed is because media organizations push one narrative over and over again. But for any of their impacts in this debate to actually matter, what they have to realize is that this debate doesn't only happen on broadcast news networks. What happens fundamentally on their side is that people move away from news, news um, broadcast network, move away from um, Fox News, move away from places like CNN to far worse alternatives, amplifying all of their harm. So if they care about that one narrative being pushed, it's much worse in those places. I want to, at the top of my speech, give two reasons for why media organizations in general are better. One, they cater to more people, which means they have to moderate their narrative and not just push one extreme one. But second, other news organizations can call out that other organization because there's more scrutiny, which means that we don't think that the harms are as bad as they actually claim that they are. Panel, you can't have a fair media without a free, uh, you can't have a fair media without a free media. My substantive will be elaborating more upon this, but before that, I want to look at two questions. Firstly, I want to answer what the role of the state is. Secondly, I want to look at what news actually is like. In terms of the role of the state, they say that the role of the state is to prevent extremism because it's not okay for the media to keep repeating the same information over and over again. But I think that their side is really unnuanced in terms of the types of people who are actually engaging with this news. We think that there are two types of people that engage with news broad, uh, with broadcasted news. The first are those who are already aligned politically, right? I mean, people aren't just flocking to Fox News for no reason. The people who are going to Fox News are already conservative and go into the uh, and pick their news platform because they're already that way. They don't change these people, right? Because these people will still remain conservative. The reason they're watching Fox News over other news organizations is because they're conservative. So it's not like they're changing because of the narratives the media is pushing. They're already this way. We think that these people, when they see these organizations changing and they see that these organizations are no longer talking about what they want, that is when they move away from them. But, uh, but secondly, we think that there are moderates, right? There are moderates who also consume broadcast media news. What happens for these people is that in the status quo, they switch between CNN, Fox News, Sky News to hear different viewpoints already. The difference on your side is that when they watch one news organization and they're under the impression that they're getting all the information from one, when in reality, these news organizations are still funded by the no, same I people, no thank you, that their side was afraid of, big corporations. They're tricked. They're fooled. We think it's much better on our side of the house for these individuals. The takeaway from this is that we don't actually think that extremism is due to the media. It's not the role of the state to intervene in these specific cases. But so what is actually the role of the state? We think the role of the state is to prevent, uh, the, role, the role of the state is not necessarily to do this. Because when they say that the role of the state is to prevent extremism, they concede to our principle that the state should not interfere in these cases. Because fundamentally what their side supports is that the BJP can say that a Muslim um, news network is too extreme um, because it's always talking about Islam and never talking about Hindu politicians being bad. Um, and you can't have a Muslim audience take solace in that. It's also crazy leftists being like this rust belter um you know news organization is too extreme because it only talks about these people the reason this is particularly important is because it's always the minority that is harmed because the minority can't sue on their side of the house they can't sue a majoritarian news network the majority and fringe nra backed groups are the ones who have the money and the ability to sue someone if they do not meet this fairness doctrine which means you'll fundamentally harm minorities structurally this is the framing the debate happens under Note that this debate isn't about things like hate speech and defamation because there's a clear distinction, right? The reason the state has things like hate speech and defamation interference is because it's the bare minimum requirement that we have uh, the state interfering. It is to prevent deliberate harm that is the threat to someone's life. This is nothing like that, and their side hasn't shown that to us yet in this debate. So we don't think that this is the role of the state. So why don't we move on to the second clash here, right, on news organizations. 
their big push is that you should be able to make a decision with the information that's given to you. Now, I'll respond more closely in my own substantive about why you won't be able to make this decision in a fairness doctrine world. But I I think what they have to realize with realize is that just leaving it up for people to make decisions is always not the best, especially when it comes to things like vaccine denialism and climate denialism. And I think this is really important, right? Because for things like vaccine de denialism on our side, you can still do things like talk about the fact that they're anti-vaxxers, but you can portray them as like a very small group of people that are wrong. On their side, they yeah, just want to I... have to give them more airtime because they need to be fair. You need to give them a platform. You need to give them 50% of the airtime, which means that you come in and you're legitimizing these people's viewpoint. You're thinking that they're right, even though they might not necessarily be that way. We think it's really difficult for you to, for example, say, I, no, thank you. You constantly platform climate denialism. So the decisions are fundamentally wrong because they're not the right decisions ultimately because you're uh, basically portraying sides uh, that are not necessarily great. The way in here is that even if we can change extreme people on either side of the house, at least moderates aren't confused about whether or not to deny vaccines or whether or not climate change is something that is real. That is the way their side is not yet. I want to now push our case a little further and explain why we think that the quality of information is lower. Because in a world where you impose this fairness doctrine on every news organization, what fundamentally happens is, this, is that these news organizations cannot exist or cannot profit or, or sustain themselves that much. Because one, they'll get a drop in engagement, right? If all news organizations in their best case are just throwing out facts about both sides, we think that no one will want to watch these news organizations anymore. So you have a dip in engagement and as a result, a dip in the funding. But secondly, we think that in a world where they can't differentiate uh, one news organization with another, that is when you'll narrow down the news organizations to just two or three. The only reason the BBC is able to exist is because it's state funded. There's no other like example that you can actually name, which means that on your side, you have a smaller number of news organizations. So the problem with that is that you don't get the amount of information that we can have because you rely on a singular news organization. That's a harmful world. That's not the world in which the media actually does good in the world. I'll take your POI. Okay, since the discipline of the fairness struck me a long time ago, there was a decline in broadcast viewers, right? Don't you think it's particularly harmful since you viewers will look for alternative look for alternative measures of, of access to information like social media, which actually promotes conspiracy theories? Yeah, exactly. We think that's worse on your side, as I'll explain. There are two parts to this argument. The first is that um, what happens is that either news organizations on your side are forced to comply um, to do this, but they're forced to do so, which means that the way they go out against the other side is they find opposing speakers who are weak and extreme representations of the other side. Which means that on your side of the house, Fox News, for example, can call Doreen Ford, the moderator of Subrabbit, to speak about workers' rights and exploitation and say that and, and pick the types of people who've never been in front of a camera, make her feel bad, even though she's from the other side. So fundamentally, even though you're bringing people from the other side, you can villainize them, you can make people believe that those individuals are not uh, actual representations of the movement. Or let's take your absolute best case scenario. These news organizations genuinely do comply. Let's just assume that these news organizations find perfectly rational, neutral, clinical representations of both sides of the house. What happens is that you as an individual feel like your news organizations have been taken, that the state is after you. That means that you're more likely to shift to places like Alex Jones, Lauren Southern, or Miguel Ser uh, Serrano, because you feel like you're not getting this from a broad stream uh, news organizations. To answer your POI, it makes it much, much worse on your side of the house than ours, which means that you have more distrust in platforms. That means that these alternative sources are significantly worse. More people go to non-mainstream news in that increases the power and the reach of conspiratorial, extreme and radicalizing news sources, the exact thing proposition was trying to avoid. We're incredibly proud to oppose. Thank you. Excuse me. Yep. Uh, Tim, Yes. Uh, we have like five minutes to switch to another internet line because this one is failing us. Okay, so uh, can, you, can I just repeat? There were like three, three people speaking at the same time earlier. Sorry. Okay, so am I audible? Yes, can you I are. Yes. Heard? Yes. <laughs>
Yeah, I think we may probably wait for Team Uganda to um confirm their tech their internet and it's whether it's working well. Um can I check that the panel is ready? Yeah. Okay, can yeah, we'll just wait for Team Uganda to confirm their internet and Okay, I think we are good now. Let me start my speech, right? Okay, um, so one of the uh, panel just went to the restroom. So uh, we'll give them, well, until they come back onto the camera, essentially, yes. Yeah, but can we maybe, okay, maybe what we could do is a bit of a test is, can I ask you to switch on the camera and maybe uh, try saying like three sentences. So like your name, um, your pro, like, yeah, your name, where you are, that kind of stuff, yeah. Okay, my name is Mbabazi Natasha Alupo, third speaker from Proposition Side. We're doing a motion about broadcast media. Awesome, Did internet we... works perfectly well. Can you... Yes, okay, Ken, all right. Can we switch Okay, Ken, in that case, um, oh no, one of, oh no now, now one of the judges is frozen. Uh, we really confirming that you can hear us. I think Uganda is frozen too. Oh. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Uganda is not frozen now, which is good. Uh, we really confirm that confirming that you can hear us. Are Are you, are you around? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Just. Okay, yeah, can oh sorry, just one of the judges um was frozen for a moment. So we just wanted to confirm that they were okay. All right, in that case, internet looks like it's going well. Um all right, uh third proposition, whenever you are ready. Here, here. Okay. My speech will begin in three, two, one. Pano, side, uh, side opposition fails to understand why we concentrated on broadcast media in this debate, yeah? Why did we feel that broadcast media is the most important one to, uh, to, to focus on in this debate? We gave you a characterization of broadcast media and why it's important in our debate and why we centered it in liberal uh, democracies, right? But side opposition fails to understand that. We talked about broadcast media as having one of the highest views, right? We characterize CNN to have 362 million viewers worldwide, Fox News to have 87 million viewers, and Al Jazeera to have 270 million viewers in 140 countries. So why we are best on uh, broadcast media is one, because um, it has the power to influence people. We talked about that, that we, it, we see it as the fifth arm of government and that it's failing to hold up other arms accountable. We also talked about how this broadcast media has the power to suppress alternative views, right? And we also talked about that other media houses actually get information from broadcast media to talk about in that in their part of the house. So we see that this is the main uh, main source of information where people actually gather their information from, right? Now, in my speech, I'm going to start with a few rebuttals, then I'll head on to the clash points, right? They come and talk about how there's going to be a drop in engagement on our side, right? How people who have who have views that are, are aligned on one side will be, oh, but we talked about a trade-off, right? We talked about how we are willing to trade off these people who want only one view or one side to be heard in order to make sure that people have equal opportunity to listen to both sides of views. And they completely ignore no, the fact that we talked about how free speech is not completely uh, uh, is not completely free, right? We talked about how there are scenarios where free speech has to be uh, cut off. It's scenarios like when they're, they're giving wrong information to children, right? When 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 this information is going to be uh, removing order in the country, when this information is dealing is dealing with privacy of individuals or is harming individuals. We talked about all those scenarios where this free speech has to be limited. And we, are, we talked about how the government already has in place uh, uh, policies that reduce this free speech in order of, of protecting other people or protecting the minorities, right? Protecting people, protecting people's privacy and, and removing cruelty or hate speech, right? We talked about all this, right? Then we talked about, then they talked about, so the drop in engagement would be more on their side because we analyze like, for example, on YouTube, there is a, 
there is a debate on flat earth and round earth. So we see that flat earth had like 1 million views, round earth had like 2 million views, but when we see flat earth versus round earth, it had 20 million views. So we see that engagement goes more if people are able to uh, listen to both sides of a story. People like a debate, people like engagement, right? And they're talking about how weaker speakers will be brought out on our side. But we see on both sides, we know people who have the best view on these topics, right? We know people who have substantial information. So we, we, we shall be able to to see if you bring up a weaker speaker on the other side, it will be easily known or easily seen because we know people who have the substantial views or the substantial information on these particular topics. So the, 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 the point of weaker speakers coming on on our side and still views being suppressed completely falls out of this debate. So they talked about how the, the state should not intervene, right? Should not intervene in this. But we talked about on our side from the first speech to the second speech, how the state has an obligation to, to, uh, to, to make sure that people get equal information. The state has that obligation. And if the state is not carrying this out, this is where the fairness talking actually comes in. They talked about how um, uh, giving people to make a decision is not always the best, for example, in terms of vaccines, right? But we see that people, we talked about how people have the best, uh, the, uh, have the best, uh, best position to make a decision which is affecting their personal lives because i know what i want i know what i, I what what uh, affects me positively or negatively right we see that if you give equal information even in terms of the vaccine like, let's take them to the best side of the case where they talk about the vaccine and how vaccine intake will be versus you know vaccine uh conspiracy theories and stuff we see that people will be even more inclined to take on this vaccine because they're showing us uh, how uh, vaccines are more important equal information, equal views, right? Then we completely narrowed out the things of, uh, uh, for example, uh, bringing in like uh, hate speech, because they talked about how we are going to be bringing in controversial issues like terrorism. But we completely narrowed that, uh, we, we put that out on our first speech and our second speech. So um, on their side, we see that there is little intervention, which we feel is very important in terms of making a decision for example, in terms of democracy, right? To hold up democracy, people need enough information in order to have that democracy apply in their lives. So this is what we are talking about. The reason why we ruled out Twitter and Facebook and news, newspapers is because we see that they are not broadcast media, which is what we're concentrating on, but also that they get information from broadcast media and apply it in those forms of media. So we see that it's the same thing. We have to go to the root of the problem and solve it there, which will solve the problem in other places right we talk the uh so on our side we talk about first of all what a broadcast media is why it is important to have them right in order to solve the problem of one polarization media induced social polarization which we see has adverse effects right people having an extreme uh, have reaching an extreme point of their views because they have not been able to hear on one side you come and talk about al jazeera right like how al jazeera would have to come and Mm, uh, would have to come and put views on how Muslims and Hindus are the same or something like that. But we see that uh, that this is not going to be possible on their side, right? Because first of all, no, if, if, if Al Jazeera wants to put up views containing Hindu people, right? Al Jazeera will bring on, uh, which we, we'll see it's already happening in status quo, where Al the, there are debates, right? But Al Jazeera is going to suppress the views of a person who has uh, alternative views on Muslims, and this is already happening in status quo, and that's what we are trying to, to reduce. How? Because the government is going to be obligated to make sure that this happens, because the government has a role to the citizens. Two, the other problem we are trying to solve on our side is journalism at the age of capitalism. We see that these journalists are making, uh, uh, are making this about the money, right? They're making this about the the profits that they are getting. And they come and talk about how uh, the media houses will not be able to stand, right? But we see that, yes, media houses in a particular way. But we see that we are, we, we are willing to take because we need to have a balance between profit and impact. One does, cannot be more than the other on the, this side. I'm that they, on their side, they're advocating for impact to be more than profit. But here we are advocating for balance. The other trade-off that we give up is regulating broadcasting companies <laughs> will, on, on their side, will, uh, 
we'll have checks and balances. Well, even if the risk of politicians abusing medias, we see that the government has an obligation to make sure that this doesn't happen. The government is the main body that is standing on this side to make sure that this does not happen. Next, we have uh, people who do not want to engage, not likely engage. Yeah, we, we think that this is a trade-off that we are willing to take. For people who only want one view to be put forward, right? Yes, they, they are going to, uh, to, to get off these, these, these media houses and they will stop listening to them, yes. But we see that the vast majority of people who would really want to listen to two sides of the story and to help them make a good decision will be, will be still engaged, right? We see that the media houses uh, get 20% of their income from us and then 80% you know, from the advertisers, which means that there is a very high chance of these advertisers um, uh, being influencers on the opinions that are going to be said on these media houses. So on our side, we completely, uh, we completely propose on the fact that we need the the, the fairness doctrine to be able to 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 be able to make sure that people's rights and people's choices are being respected. Thank you very much. All right, I intend the speaker for that speech. Uh, can I check that the panel is ready? All right, uh, to conclude the substantive portion of this debate, can we have the third speaker of the opposition? Here, here. Just checking that Hibisha is audible and visible. Can you say something? Uh, hi. Am I audible? Uh, yep, she's audible and she's visible, but the light behind her is like obscuring her face. But that, that's about it. Right. Yeah. Better? Perfect. Okay. Uh, PO is audible, please. I'm starting my speech in three, two, one. Every time side proposition wants to talk about climate change, they have to bring someone who's a climate denier because that's just the true balance of perspectives on news. Every time they want to talk about vaccines, they also have to represent people who think vaccines are actually just causing autism. Every time they want to talk about women's right and their ability to access abortion, they also have to show people screaming murder on those women, saying that that is not what is something they should be doing. I'm so proud to oppose. I have three clashes in this speech time. Firstly, on the principle. Secondly, on which side increases polarization. Thirdly, on which side covers much more information and issues in journalism. Firstly, then, on the principle. What did we tell you right from our first speech? We told you that the state is able to influence what is shown in media on their side of the house. A couple of responses that we heard from them, and let's deal with that. Firstly, on this idea that it is only invest in liberal democracies, we told you right from the beginning, it doesn't have to be. It's also about weak democracies like India. But second, even if it is about Western liberal democracies, this is also about, for instance, Nixon being able to shift away the focus from Watergate because recognize any state would be able, would love to jump at this opportunity to shut down criticism against them. And that also includes Western liberal democracies. Just imagine what Trump would have done with this. But secondly, on this idea that we already have regulations in the status quo, and so it's not total free speech. There are two differences between existing regulations on hate speech and misinformation and what they're doing for a couple of years. First, notice that the bar for the regulations that we set right now is extremely, extremely high. That is to say, you literally have to use slurs or weaponize someone's identity against them for the state to be able to ban that sort of information. That means you're causing direct harm on individuals. That is not a bar that they've yet proved to us. But secondly, notice, recognize that the fairness doctrine is considerably much more subjective than hate speech, and that's when you get scope for government intervention. Because now the government is telling me the organizations, you should talk about these topics and not talk about those topics because they're not important enough. And this is the way you should talk about them because you have to represent this side, also represent this side. This is the amount of time you should give them. That's when you actually take away the freedom of speech on their side of the house. But lastly, in this clash, notice any argument that they gave you about state obligation to protect individuals that's completely hung on the practical because you cannot protect 
individuals, if not, for instance, if you aren't able to prove the fact that there's harm being caused to them, that means that that's hung on the practical. It is our principle that is an independent path to victory for us on weighing why this is enough for us to win this debate. First, because the role of media by their own characterization is to be the fourth pillar of democracy to hold the state to account. And that's not something it's able to do on their side of the house. But second notice, because the practical on ground impacts of this, that is to say, you can't call out governments now because you just don't know what they're doing wrong. Because every time you call out a policy, the government is given a lot of time to respond back to it. That's when you can't vote them out. And that's when you can't actually think that they're doing something wrong. So. Uh, moving on to a second clash then on polarization. Before I move on, is there any POI? Saying that, at the top of this clash, I just want to make it very clear, they cannot just argue that all controversial issues are hate speech and they're not going to be talking about that on their side of the house. There's a difference between calling women violence slurs and telling them that they're just unsure that the gender pay gap really exists. There's an opinion and that's a hate speech. There's a massive, massive difference. They have to contend with the opinions on their side of the house. Let's then deal with what they told us. Firstly, on this idea that you espouse the same information again and again, this is the only source of indiv information that individuals have. I have three responses to this. First, recognize we no longer live in the 1950s, right? Individuals have a number of accesses to information right now, just through broadcast networks as well, because there's not just one TV channel that exists, but multiple of them that exist. They have to prove to us why individuals would never be able to access them on either side. But secondly, notice every channel has an incentive to already be not extreme, too extreme on, our, uh, on uh, either side of the house, because that means that you get a large numbers of viewers only on our, on our but lastly, notice you often often have views that are already shaped that is to things like communities, etc. It's just untrue that these, for instance, are the sole way that your show is shaping people's views, shaping people's information. And they can see this, right? When they when they tell you in their uh, third speaker that, for instance, you'll recognize who's the weaker speaker is, you'll recognize when they're straw manning, for instance, but you can't recognize the point which only one source of information exists. That's something that, consists, that they can see. But let's then deal with what we also told you. We told you that you're just much more likely to show mainstream entrenched of fringe but powerful perspectives because these are the people who have the most power who can afford to do things like litigation who can afford to do things like sue these media and this is where i respond directly to their argument about corporations can influence because recognize that we agree that corporations are going to be rich on either side of the house however on their side of the house corporations can simply litigate the most because the money they have it means two things one they can get their views represented the most but secondly to prevent a situation where you lose thousands of money media companies end up self-selecting into the sorts of information they're giving because they don't want to be, uh, for instance, in the future be sued by them. That means that on our yeah. side of the house, sure, there's one media channel that was controlled by the corporation. On their side of the house, all media channels are literally platforming, for instance, the fact that fossil fuels are not actually causing climate change. But lastly, notice it means that what this means is that you can't get the most vulnerable able to get that information because minorities like social justice movements don't have the power to litigate, don't have the power to sue, and don't get that represented on their side of the house. But let's then deal with this argument that you lose trust from social media. I have a couple of responses to this. Because if they thought that viewers cared just about being neutral, cared about watching debates, boy, do they have news for them. A three response. Yeah. Firstly, notice that if this was true, they can just move to any other channel, like for instance, CNN, if they wanted, if they were so scared of Fox News, because there are channels that are moderate right now. But secondly, notice social media isn't really the very neutral platform that these people would be moving to, right? Everyone recognizes that social media is pretty radical. That's not where individuals would move. But lastly, notice this is the people that are very, very less in number because you're not often watching and analyzing news and making sure every side is well represented. You're just listening for often confirming the all more views that you already have. But let's then compare this to the argument that we gave you from Karthik's second speech when we told you that you much more likely push individuals into social media on their side of the house because of the fact they don't feel represented, because they feel disengaged, because they want the information that you stop them from having on their side. That means one, you create much more radicalization, but second, you st uh, strengthen echo chambers. And here's when they, want, when they wanted to talk to you about the fact that you literally reinforce information again and again, that's when you do it again because your for you page will only show you the stuff that you've already liked in the past. You've worsened that a, a large extent on their side of the house. But lastly, notice you end up having to platform extreme ideologies even on uh, much more mainstream channels now. And that is really, really bad because of two reasons. One, recognize that extreme ideologies is much more easier to explain because it's just easier, for instance, an abortion activist to come up and yell, oh no, this is murder, rather than having to explain the history of 
for instance, what years, what weeks is abortion legal are, what, for instance, the black market for abortion looks like. But secondly, they're less entrenched. That means it takes less, less, it takes them much more time to, for instance, argue against that. That means you just get and spread much more extreme views on their side of the house. Last clash then on less information. We gave you three reasons why you get crucially less information from their side of the house. We still haven't heard any response to this. On being, why is this enough for us to win this debate independently? One, you crowd out information about the most vulnerable about minorities, and that's when you worsen interactions with them. That's when you, for instance, in the on the ground are not likely to vote for their rights, etc. But the, secondly, you don't get information about the biggest atrocities in the world, then you're not likely to, for instance, get investigative journalism and talk about the Catholic Church's abuses. That's when you hurt victims more, don't give them the justice you need. For all of these reasons, I have never been prouder to oppose. All right, I turn the speaker for that speech, checking if my panel is ready. Yep, all right. Uh, to conclude this debate for side opposition, can we have the reply speaker of the opposition? Here, here. Can I just watch this debate Yeah, just checking that I'm both audible and visible. Yep, yes, you are. Amazing. Perfect. Just give me a second. Setting up there. Speaker, third proposition says, and I quote, people like a debate. Flatter debatings featuring both sides of the house get more engagement and views. But if you read your notes panel, you realize that this is what we've been saying since first off. In our second argument, we literally told you that some news organizations already put out diverse news points to boost engagement. This is very, very important because third proposition knights their prime minister and deputy who repeatedly tell you that the media right now only shows one side, only is hyper-polarized. At the end of this round, Uganda runs far too close to our case and knives their first and second in the process. But even if that's true, let's make one thing exceptionally clear. The comparative and difference between both sides of the house is this. First, on both, yes, we agree. Diverse viewpoints probably exist to some extent, but here's what they do on their side of the house. Proposition makes viewers feel like the state is perverting and corrupting the media. That's the point at which the terrible alternatives that they talk to you about, people like Alex Jones, are flooded to. We think that on their side of the house, sure, they try to co-op some of our benefits, but they really don't. What they open themselves up to is the myriad of harms that we push down the line. Two questions in this speech. First, on which side has a greater quality of news? Second, on polarization and the influence over news that different actors exercise. On the first question, we told you that this drastically goes down on their side of the house for a lot of reasons down the line, but here's the two most important ones. First, it drastically goes down because news organizations are forced to reduce complexity of their stories. This is true because as we've explained, they have less time to go in depth because they have to show both sides and time is limited. But second, as we've told you, when governments are determining what is nationally important, things that are inevitably deprioritized are things like minority stories, are things like tailor-made news to your regional and local communities. Why is this so important in this debate? By propositions metric itself, the purpose of media is to inform you such that you can maximize agency. Fundamentally, at the point at which they drastically reduce the quality of news, they lose by virtue of their own metric and they reduce the capability for that. But on the second clash, I want to note that winning the first clash in and of itself offers us a massive independent path to victory. But I'm going to prove this clash for the fun of it. First, polarization and influence over the news. Let's make one thing clear. As we've told you down the line and goes completely unengaged with, they force sexism, they force racism, and they force transphobia into the mainstream, where people like Ben Shapiro and the most fringe elements in society are now put on national TV and given platforms. That is terrible because it allows them to spread their messaging and further indoctrinate people. But second, as we've told you since first itself, and Karthik makes a very big deal out of in its argument, Proposition hates Alex Jones. They literally, in first proposition, tell you that this is the worst impact in this round. 
However, they force people into it because of the point at which you think your media is no longer a safe space for you. Because as a very conservative redneck person in rural Texas, all you see now on CNN are sure the people you like, but are also Bernie Sanders and AOC. That's when you move away from Fox News. That's when you move into worse unregulated alternatives that both sides agree are terrible. But third, we think that we think that governments are now able to shut down criticism. Even in the Western liberal democracies that Uganda likes to make this debate about, we saw what Nixon did. We saw what JFK did. This is so much worse for developing nations. And what this creates on their side of the house is a chilling effect that is crucially just terrible. At the end of this round, Speaker, we won both important clashes in this round. They narrow their impact down to only WLDs, 5% of the international population and literally the most privileged people. Our case accounted for the most vulnerable. But second, they spent so much time rebutting that freedom of press needs to have a limit. But from first, we never disagreed. We supported those limits as well. What we didn't support was their overreach. You can't have a fair media without a free media. But if you'd like to tip the scales, tip them in favor of Team India oppose. All right, thank the speaker for that speech, checking if the panel is ready. All right, to conclude this debate for side proposition and the run as a whole, can we have the reply speaker of the proposition? Here, here. Um, I have a small communication. Um. I'm going to do reply. Yes, first if I'm going to reply, why my mama So is it okay to start my speech now? Wait, uh, sorry, clarifying. Uh, are you switching the speakers as giving the reply or? Oh, no. Okay, yeah. Uh, feel free to continue. Uh, you can start whenever you're ready. Yeah. Okay. So my name is Mohammad Raima. I'm going to start my speech in three to one panel, if you continue to preach one narrative in a society over and over again, it creates a cult of people who oppose the other views that come about. We affirm this motion panel. We believe that televisions have an incentive to get viewership, right? So basically we still have equality of representation on our side of the house, where we tell you that televisions will actually implement people, right? They'll bring people of opposing views who actually are liked by people to actually increase their viewership. So any points of side negative on this view actually fall out on this debate today as came in the first speech, right? Panel. Secondly, let's move on to diversity. Which side of the house has more diversity? It's actually more on our side because we accept and we make people actually bring both views on the table, right? We bring both views other than side affirmative and side negative side, which actually is current status, but which actually brings one side of the view and preaches it over and over again. But for us, we'd rather actually bring more as it's preached on our side of the house, right? And on the issue of minorities, right? Panel, we tell you that this has actually been preached from past speech where you actually only preach one view, right? Minorities only come about when people are extremists and extremists mean extremism comes about when like you preach only one view to people right and those people buy into that view right we hate abortion right we buy into that view right we continue buying into that view so we start making those people who are both minorities right it only comes about in those particular instances that's what we may get on our side of the house right panel moving on right panel they come and tell us that well no one wants to watch the news again but panel we come and tell you that people have already lost trust in news currently, right, on status quo in their world of the house, on their side of the house, right? Trust was lost because people do not have accountability, right? And when the fairness doctrine was there first in the US, that's when people actually had the most trust in the media, right? So panel, we're looking for a way to actually get more trust in this media when we implement this kind of fairness doctrine, right? Panel, moving on, right? Panel, we have to understand the majority of the people who actually fund this media are capitalists, right? There are people from outside, which is preached from past speech, right? So panel, when they fund this media right if i'm an old company and i fund this media they are more inclined to preach more on oil right oil is good than bringing out the bad things of oil which actually leads to lack of information to people which is a world that we don't want aside from it as it's preached from our first speech. moving on panel we come and tell you that we frame out ideas of toxic racism right panel we come and frame to you that these things are actually being worked upon on status quo right the things that we want to actually have in our society debated upon alternative views that do not lead to of people which is not terrorism right we do not want terrorism this is framed out from our past 
speech, right, panel? We come and tell you that we want military expenditure, right? Policy making. This is the kinds of things you want to have controversial views upon, right? Panel, moving on to what we actually bring to you in our side of the house, right? Panel, we come and tell you why governments need to intervene in media in this social polarization, right? Why we show you why we actually focus on broadcast media, right? And like how social media actually gets news from broadcast media. So when you tackle broadcast media, this big broadcast media, you can actually solve the whole issue of socially of media induced social polarization, right? Which is then tackled by side negative panel. Let me tell you that we focus this debate on liberal democracy, but not necessarily Western liberal democracies, which was a clear misinterpretation that was brought about by side negative. But panel moving on, we tell you the effect of capitalism on big media, whether they finance and they preach their views to this big media, right? We come and tell you our trade offs, right? Panel, where we tell you free speech, we come and tell you things about how governments actually might actually come and intervene where we show you that the government's role, right? They have a role to actually look out for their citizens due to the social contract. Secondly, we show you how they would want to actually be voted into power, which our side is better because they are more pushed to actually carry out this policy to help the citizens than the side of side negative, where actually just leave the media to do whatever they want and they are like held accountable at this particular case scenario, right? Panel, we like debate. That's why we are debating here, right? Debate is a very healthy thing in society and we wouldn't be seated here right now if we actually oppose debate. That's why we affirm this motion because we come and bring to you both views and you decide that they're going to judge for us today. Thank you very much. All right, I thank the speaker for that speech and I thank all six speakers for this debate. Uh, normally I'll ask everyone to cross the floor and shake hands, but we are all in different parts of the world. So I'm going to ask everyone to use the clapping hand uh, emoji reaction on Zoom to give everyone a round of applause for a good job well done. Uh, it was an enjoyable debate and I'm sure we'll have a good time discussing it. So I'm going to... Okay. All right. So firstly, let me just say on behalf of the panel that we thank everyone for this debate. Uh, this was a very rich motion. We saw examples from a range of different countries across different time periods. And we're very impressed and also quite happy, actually, that teams did do their research for a prepared motion in what was, I think, not a very easy motion to deal with. And we offer our heartiest congratulations to teams for that in that sense. Uh, we did like this debate. And ultimately, after conferral, we did come into a unanimous decision in favor for the opposition. So that's a 3-0 win to India. Congratulations and commiserations to Team Uganda. The way I'm going to explain this call is through the categories of style, content, and strategy. I'll spend less time on style, although I will make one very important point on style, and we'll talk about that, uh, perhaps more in personal feedback afterwards. More time will be spent on content and strategy because that's where the debate primarily took place. So on style, there's really only one point, and I would note that for some judges, style was a point that really mattered for the margin in the debate. Uh, we will note that there is a difference between a aggressive style and a style that comes across as rude and dismissive. So saying things like, for example, and here I'm quoting proof for the fun of it, or claiming that a certain team is scared of certain things can come across as rude and at times dismissive. So we would urge speakers to be a little bit more careful with their choice of diction, as well as their word choice, because uh, we want to, it's perfectly fine to be aggressive, but we want to make sure that we are doing so in a polite manner that doesn't cause, you know, other speakers perhaps to feel a little bit um, hurt or offended by certain uh, matters. We can talk about this in personal feedback afterwards. I believe the speakers know who they are and we can talk about that uh, in personal feedback afterwards. The way in which this debate came down to primarily was in three questions. And here I'm going to combine a com content and strategy together. The first question that we needed to ask as a panel was the question of should the government intervene in this matter? So is there a principal necessity for the government to step in to regulate the media in a way through the mechanism of a fairness doctrine. We would note at the onset that both teams in this debate agree that hate speech laws do exist. We will also note as well that the proposition that the opposition's call out of the proposition setup of this being only in Western liberal democracies isn't necessarily true in as much as the P1 setup was in liberal democracies, but we would note that the context didn't really matter in as much as both teams were using examples from the US to a large extent. So we don't think that the context battle really mattered much in the debate as a whole. How do we look at this issue then? The proposition in this debate we felt sets up a fair principle. They suggest that governments owe an obligation to people to protect them from the harms of extremism and radicalization. They have a principle hey, obligation. Yep. Uh, yes, Team Uganda, sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, 
okay, I in the case, I'm just going to continue because I maybe that might have been a misclick. Yeah, so as I was saying, we felt that the propositions does set up a very fair principle in this debate, arguing that governments owe obligations to protect um, the citizens from things like extremism, radicalization, as well as to make things fair, generally speaking. The main issue that the panel felt, however, was that there was quite little mechanism provided for this. So things that we were looking for, for instance, were things like why through the specific mechanism of a fairness doctrine. I think what the proposition was able to prove was the suggestion that says that a fairness doctrine allows for us to achieve certain outcomes, like for example, um, get more news coming into the picture and we will discuss this in the second issue afterwards but i think at least at this onset it's not particularly clear why through this specific mechanism of the fairness doctrine and this is something that needs to be considered in comparison to the opposition the opposition we thought gave us broadly two lines of material here that we did credit as responses the first thing that the opposition does was to kind of challenge the problem setup of the proposition so the proposition's problem set up here was really that people are only looking at one piece of news and this creates echo chambers and then therefore that becomes a problem because it creates extremism and radicalization. The opposition challenges this by suggesting that there are existing status quo incentives. One, for example, if you're a large news corporation, you have an incentive to moderate towards the, uh, the moderate because that's how you catch the most amount of viewers. We also felt they were able to demonstrate that there was a variety of people or a spectrum of people that watched the news and that the people who were already aligned to a certain political view may not change necessarily, whereas the individuals who are not aligned to the view are the ones that are likely to change in this debate. So we did think that there was a added spectrum of analysis here provided by the opposition that we didn't feel that the proposition was able to address adequately um, in this debate. There was a second line as well that came from the opposition. There's this idea that... Um, this is a overreach of government autonomy that infringes upon the editorial agency of news networks because this gives governments too much power in making the news. They can define what is newsworthy and what isn't newsworthy. And therefore, you can use that to do things like avoid accountability. And here they gave us three examples for the US for doing this. I think at the overall evaluation of this question of should the government intervene, the panel felt unanimously that the proposition managed to demonstrate that there was perhaps a reason for us to believe that the governments maybe should intervene, but we felt that the proposition wasn't able to prove the reason for that in as, uh, in as much as we felt that the material itself wasn't fully mechanized. Comparatively, we felt that the opposition was able to cast enough doubt on the principle and therefore we felt this issue went to the proposition. The second issue, which was I think where again most of the debate took place in, was on the question of quality of information and informed decision making. We will note that from Prop 2 onwards, a lot of the debate then became a question about which side of the house is able to achieve better decision making because both teams in this debate wanted to get more news out to the people and the argument coming from proposition was that with more news, you will be able to get more informed decision making and that therefore was a benefit. Over here, we will note that the proposition does a, we would say, a, a, a setup of the status quo. They suggest that in the status quo, there is only one narrative that's being set up by the news. This is bad because this means that individuals feel that they are not addressed and they will go to alternative media, which is worse because these have fake news and conspiracy theories, and that leads to radicalization, which informs, which, which results therefore in less informed decision making. The comparative that we get on proposition then is that in as much as there's a fairness doctrine, you are now able to have both sides of the story that's presented in the news. This is comparatively better because this allows for things like debates between individuals that allows for more people to act to see the news that is there. The main ch challenge that we get from this coming up from the from the opposition uh, was really on two levels. The first level of response that we get from them is this idea that but now you will need to force individuals like anti-vaxxers, climate change deniers to also get onto the news. We have this quibble over whether you will get the caricature, like what is essentially the caricature of the individuals or will you get like say other, uh, or, or will you get the experts to do this? The prop suggests that is the experts, the op says it's caricatures. It's not very clear which characterization is stronger here. But what we did get from this particular challenge, however, was a challenge that suggested that maybe the debates that the proposition wanted may not necessarily be the debates that lead to better informed decision making. And therefore, we felt that in that sense, uh, we weren't quite clear how much credit we have given to the argument that more news equals more informed decision making. 
There was a second challenge as well, which suggests that you are that the prop that the opposition right that the proposition will lose access to minority stories and lose access to investigative journalism. These came out in the O one as well as in as well as in the O two. We generally felt that these materials were very well mechanized and perhaps weren't adequately addressed by the by the proposition in that sense. So at the conclusion of the second issue of quality of information and informed decision making, the panel felt that the proposition was able to demonstrate that they were able to get more news in general. But it's not particularly clear whether more news would necessarily lead, therefore, to more informed decision making, which is a added that which is a added logical step that needed to be done for the impact of the argument to be derived as a result. We felt comparatively that the opposition was able to challenge that missing link, and in as much as that was done, we didn't think that the proposition was therefore able to claim the benefit they wanted to get. The last point is a point about capitalism at the news. We would say this is a smaller point because this is a point that came up in first proposition. It didn't come up very clearly in the second speech, came up a lot more clearly in the third speech, and then didn't come up very much in the reply speech. So we found that this point, generally speaking, was a point that the proposition wins quite handedly in as much as the opposition doesn't do a particularly good job of responding to the argument, which is really this idea that corporate incentives guide the news and therefore the news reduce narratives in a certain particular way. But in as much as this material wasn't given enough attention in the debate by the team, so for example, it wasn't brought up repeatedly in a round to remind us of its importance, the panel didn't really know to what extent we can give this argument full credit and full weightage, and therefore we felt that this particular issue uh, wasn't one that determined the result as a whole. So that's uh, why in the areas of content as well as strategy, because I talked a little bit here about responses, external responses as well, we felt that the opposition was also a hit as a whole. Uh, I see a messages from the outcome that the Zoom may be reset, so maybe what I would suggest is uh, given that we cannot do feedback in two minutes, that maybe we can address uh, urgent questions now, and then we can do personal feedback via Discord, and the coaches can feel free to text us via whatever means possible. Yeah, so if there are any questions about the call, uh, please feel free to ask them now before they shut down the Zoom. Um, yeah, also, uh, just before questions, I'd just like to yeah. say I'm super sorry to team again.